Okay. Um, let's see. Am I unmuted now? Yes. Uh, okay. So, yeah, thank you very much for having me today. I uh, really am excited to be talking to uh, such a, a great group of, of experts. It's, it's more challenging to know that you're talking to somebody who already knows <laughs> a lot about it. And um, I'm really excited to be here. And I want to thank Greg for uh, asking me and, and helping me get set up here and also to Lance for dealing with the technology. Um, this is a challenging, challenging time for everybody. Uh, we've been in Grapevine for 15 years, but Marshall Grain has been around since 1946. And um, in 2015, we launched a landscape division and with that an organic lawn maintenance program. We don't do mowing and, and stuff like that, but we do um, uh, all of your fertilization and, and pest control and disease control and things like that for Texas lawns. So, um, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Oh, and I wanted to mention too that we're really proud of the fact that we have uh, one of our employees is, is currently studying to become a master gardener. So we're really excited to that he wants to do that and that uh, he's taking the time to do that. And we're glad to have him on our staff with all that knowledge. So anyway, I uh, uh, was asked to talk about organic lawn care. And um, I don't know if we can do this or not. Uh, maybe you can just um, uh, put something in the chat box, but I'd kind of like to know uh, uh, I don't know if you can do a separate separate poll, Lance, but I'd like to know, uh, first of all, um, how many of you are, um, you know, taking care of a lawn, either your own lawn or somebody else's lawn, and, uh, and then how many of you are uh, already uh, using organic methods? So I don't know if we can just take a moment to have people um, let me know about that, and I'll continue to talk while you're while you're figuring that out. Um, yes, the Marshall Grain employee who's the intern is, uh, is Matt Zell. Uh, thanks for putting that up there. Uh, anyway, um, to start with, I'm going to go to screen share. Great, thank you. Um, also, too, if you sign up for our mailing list, um, you can go to our website and sign up for our mailing list and you will get um, uh, notifications anytime that we post a new article on our blog site. Uh, there's already a lot of uh, information about organic lawn care on there as well as uh, other organic gardening topics. So I invite you to take a look at that. And uh, anyway, I wanted to start by giving a, an overview of um, the difference between um, organics and synthetic methods. And um, uh, they really work differently from each other. Uh, organic products are obviously um, natural versus synthetic, which are more concentrated forms of the nutrients uh, that you're putting into your soil. So uh, an organic um, uh, product would be uh, the things listed here on the left, like alfalfa meal and, and cottonseed meal and so forth. And whereas in a uh, synthetic program, uh, your, your sulfates and nitrates are gonna be concentrated uh, many, many times over what, um, you would see in an organic um, uh, system. And uh, because of that, there's, they build up in the soil and they kill off a lot of the beneficial organisms in the soil that are needed to break down organic matter and make, plant, uh, make nutrients available to the plants. Uh, they also pollute our groundwater and uh, they can even, depending on what you're putting out there, uh, they can be toxic to, um, to you and your, and your family and so forth. Uh, so, but, whoops, I jumped ahead here, I'm sorry. Um, 
as far as gardening is concerned, um, synthetic fertilizers, basically what they do is uh, they fertilize the plant. They force the plant to take up nutrients, whether it wants it or not. And uh, whereas in an organic program, you're feeding the soil, you're enriching the soil and improving the, um, the uptake system uh, that the plant relies on uh, to unlock uh, the nutrients in the soil and to absorb those into the plant. So it's really a completely different approach. Um, the, all those sulfates and nitrates take a lot longer to break down. And so, as I mentioned, they build up in the soil, uh, salts build up in the soil, which means that you need to apply more water than you would if you were on an organic program. Uh, and uh, like I said, they kill off a lot of the organisms in the soil that you need for um, a healthy environment. Uh, you lose a lot of your um, uh, microscopic life that helps fight pests and diseases when you do that too. Uh, so in other words, they're really not compatible with each other. It's not like you can mix and match. Uh, this week I'm gonna put an organic fertilizer and, and next week I'm gonna put um, a uh, synthetic one. Uh, you really can't work it that way. You have to pick one system or the other and stick with it. So, um, as I started to say, there's a lot of other benefits to being organic besides the fact that you will uh, save money on your landscape by not having to input as many uh, things. Once you've been on an organic program, you will, lose, uh, you will use uh, less fertilizer, less water, uh, less other inputs, soil amendments, and so forth. Uh, once you get once you get onto the system and have been on it for a while, uh, you're going to actually spend less money. Uh, you're also going to be uh, helping the environment and protecting the water supply. And and um, a really key thing about it is you're going to be working with nature instead of against it. So uh, those are just some of the advantages of of being organic. Um, and I will answer your questions if I don't answer them as I'm speaking. I'll uh, try to make sure I answer them at the end. Let's see. So it looks like uh, a few of you are organic, uh, but you're not having uh, a lot of success. Uh, some of you are still having issues, it looks like. So um, we'll talk about all those things. And uh, so there's basically four steps to becoming organic. Um, stop killing things. That's the first thing. Stop killing uh, insects and um, uh, uh, reptiles and, and whatnot that live in your garden. Uh, if you do nothing else, if you just uh, ignore your yard altogether and not do anything, uh, it will be much healthier and sustainable than, uh, than you, it would be if you were on a chemical program. So um, stop killing things, uh, start using an organic fertilizer, and then uh, the really key thing is to start working on enriching your soil. So organic fertilizer is part of that, but it's not all of it. And then finally, um, how do you deal with weeds and, and, and what happens when you do have pests and so forth? Uh, so I'm going to be talking about all those things here as we go along. Go. So um, when I say stop killing things, um, basically the um, soil, when it's in proper balance, uh, the harmful insects are going to be controlled by their beneficial counterparts. Every, every bad insect out there has a beneficial counterpart. And uh, so, and they're ready, you know, to help you keep your, your system, your lawn and your garden under control. Uh, for instance, birds love to eat army worms. And if you're not familiar with them. Uh, this is what they look like in this picture here. These are army worms. Uh, and they will destroy your lawn if they get out of control. 
Uh, so you don't really want them, but uh, again, one way to control them is to uh, allow the birds to eat them. If you're poisoning your soil and uh, lawn with chemicals, you're also going to be harming the birds that would eat the armyworms. So uh, there again, there's an interconnection there that um, uh, is uh, part of being organic. And, um, and then, of course, uh, sometimes nature alone is not sufficient. Sometimes there just aren't enough birds to eat all the army worms. So uh, one thing to consider would be to use a repellent rather than a pesticide. A lot of insects like chiggers uh, uh, and so forth can be repelled from the lawn or rather than killed. Uh, so that's, uh, of course, chiggers aren't something you really want to uh, you know, preserve, but um, there are a lot of other uh, insects that would be killed if you put down something poisonous. So um, that's what we're trying to avoid on the organic program. Now, this picture here I took was taken in 2018. And if you remember, in the fall of 2018, we had a massive infestation of army worms all across the Metroplex. And in that case, obviously, Mother Nature alone, uh, bird, there weren't enough birds to eat all the army worms or whatever. And so um, rather than, again, using a chemical that would have killed all of the insects in the soil, uh, we were able to successfully treat many of our customers' yards just using a product called Bacillus thuringiensis. Uh, bacillus is a, is a bacteria uh, thuringiensis is the type of bacteria, so uh, we call it BT for short. Uh, another organic product that works really well on armyworms uh, would be spinosad. Uh, so there again, there's two products there that you could use that specifically target caterpillars in your lawn and not harm any of the other creatures in your lawn that you want to preserve. Uh, and also, too, if the birds were to eat those army worms, then uh, they would still be okay. It wouldn't harm them if they were to eat the, the army worms after they had been sprayed. So, um, in an organic program, you want to try to think of what method can I use that's going to do the least amount of harm and uh, uh, only spray uh, what you need to spray when you need to spray it and um, uh, try to use something that's, that's specific to the insect that you're, that you're going after. So, uh, I'm sorry, this one was out of order. This one should have been earlier. Um, but uh, um, when you fertilize with an organic fertilizer, I should explain this, when you fertilize with an organic fertilizer, um, again, you're treating the soil, not the plant. And um, uh, with synthetic fertilizers, the other problem with them is that you're only getting macronutrients. You're only getting the NPK, the nitrogen, the phosphate, and the potassium. Whereas with organic fertilizers, they also include other organic material uh, considered to be micronutrients that your plant needs. So that's another difference. Um, another difference is that the NPK numbers are going to be much different between the two. An organic fertilizer uh, is going to have uh, much lower numbers. A typical lawn fertilizer, the NPK numbers are going to be like 10, 15, 10. Uh, or even in some cases, people use things like 30, 30, 30, which is an incredible amount of, of product to be putting down at one time on, on your plants. Uh, so by comparison, an organic fertilizer is going to have like our Texas two-step uh, is going to be a 512. The nitrogen comes from the alfalfa meal that's in the product. Uh, and then um, our uh, other one uh, to the right, the Nature's Creations Turf Food with Mycorrhizal Fungi is a 422. 
and that uses poultry litter as the nitrogen source. So again, there, the numbers are going to be much, much lower. Um, also, too, if you're familiar with corn gluten meal, which I'll talk more about later, uh, corn gluten meal has 9% nitrogen in it. Uh, so that can also be used as a as a lawn fertilizer. And uh, but the 900, which is what corn gluten meal is, is like about the highest organic fertilizer you're gonna you're gonna be able to find. Uh, there there's I can't think of anything that's going to give you more than 9% nitrogen on an organic program. Um, I like to compare it to someone who eats greasy food, greasy fried foods three times a day, and then takes vitamin tablets, uh, you know, to, to make up for the lack of nutrients in their diet versus someone who just eats healthy food, uh, fresh fruits and vegetables and stuff on a regular basis. So that's kind of, you know, what you're doing when you're using a synthetic fertilizer. Uh, what often happens too with these high NPK synthetic fertilizers is the plant will put on um, a lot of top growth that's not supported by the roots underneath it. So the plant will burst up with, you know, you'll get a, a burst of, of fresh new growth on top and it'll look really great for a little while and then it'll collapse back on itself because it doesn't have the roots underneath it to support that top growth. Uh, you don't have to worry about that kind of stuff with organics. You don't have to worry about burning your lawn uh, and because you're not going to be putting out all that much nitrogen to begin with. Um, the um, If you're switching from an organic program, uh, from a synthetic to an organic program, it will probably take a while for all of the chemicals in your soil to uh, wash out and so forth, or break down. So it'll uh, take a few weeks at least for that to happen. So if you're making a switch, uh, I would say just, you know, for at least a few weeks, just stop putting anything on your on your soil and uh, and then make that switch to organics. Uh, generally speaking, we tell people if, if you're just switching, uh, it can take one to three years for your lawn uh, to make a complete transformation from the synthetic to the organic. And um, uh, before you get the full benefit of being on an organic program. Uh, but you should start seeing improvements, um, you know, f within a year. So um, the, uh, with regular applications of uh, organics, you can fertilize up to four times a year. We recommend two to four times a year in that first year. Uh, obviously, you want to do that um, in the spring and the fall, uh, two applications in the spring, two in the fall, and, um, and then start working on enriching your soil. That is uh, probably should be number one, probably should be the most important thing you do uh, other than not killing stuff, uh, because if you're still using chemicals, these are the kinds of creatures you're going to be killing off or the earthworms and beneficial nematodes and beneficial bacteria, uh, lots of little tiny insects that we don't even think about when we look at our soil. Uh, all of these things are essential to breaking down organic matter. So, um, you know, we want to encourage this diversity um, in the soil and uh, that's what an organic program is designed to do. So uh, you can help all of these by uh, using products like, um, like these here are some of our top soil amendments that we recommend for lawns would be uh, uh, like for the first year, you might want to put down a layer of compost uh, that may get expensive for some people, but it would be beneficial to start with uh, to put down, say, a half inch layer of compost on top of your lawn and just let that uh, sit and work down into the soil. 
Uh, the other things that you can do um, are to use uh, lava sand, uh, which is a great product uh, for uh, clay soil, especially. Um, if you're if you're putting in a new lawn for the first time, obviously before you plant it, you can till the soil and you can till some of these ingredients into the dirt before you plant. Uh, but if you already have an existing lawn, which is going to be true for most of us, um, you want something that you can just spread on top. So uh, again, the compost you can spread on top. Um, you can uh, um, also use the lava sand, the green sand, and the dry molasses. All three of these products are easily put out with a fertilizer spreader and uh, can be done pretty much any time of the year. Uh, lava sand, if you're not familiar with it, is a porous volcanic rock uh, that will help to aerate the soil. It'll work its way down into the soil and help to aerate and push apart those, uh, that compacted clay. And uh, because it's porous, it will also help retain moisture. Uh, so you'll be able to uh, start saving water by opening up your soil and making it more porous. And then uh, green sand is a mineral supplement that is going to add trace minerals like iron, calcium, magnesium into the soil. Uh, you can use both of these. The green sand will also help to open up the, the heavy clay soil. And uh, uh, you can apply these at least twice a year. Uh, and then the molasses is, I see somebody asked about fire ants uh, over here. Uh, dry molasses is a sugar uh, that feeds uh, the microorganisms in the soil, helps to stimulate them and increase their numbers. And um, as it happens, fire ants don't like that. Fire ants, generally speaking, prefer poor, soil to nice, healthy, uh, organic soil. And we think the reason is because there are just too much uh, going on in the soil for them. There are beneficial uh, nematodes, for example, that will specifically attack uh, fire ants. And um, uh, in fact, we sell, I'll talk a little bit more about that later as well, but we sell a special strain of beneficial nematodes that specifically feed on the larva of fire ants. Um, that helps get rid of them, but uh, we think in general that having healthy organic soil is just makes them uncomfortable. So they tend to stay away from those areas that are well composted. Um, the um, molasses is a way to help in uh, speed up the process of breaking down organic matter. And that you can apply basically as often as once a month. Uh, and that will, um, that will help with a, a lot of things in the soil. So soil amendments that you can spread on top, um, start doing that as soon as you can. And then uh, number four is uh, controlling weeds. That's a big deal for most of us. Um, and of course, if you're uh, thinking about lawn weeds, uh, you need to think in terms of both a, using both a pre-emergent and a post-emergent. Um, for organic programs, the uh, pre-emergent solution is corn gluten meal. And then we have a number of options uh, for post-emergents. Uh, and I'll get into that here uh, in just a second. Now, corn meal, uh, corn gluten meal, is um, really, uh, it really does work, uh, but it does have to be used properly. Uh, there, there are some tricks to it, but if you use it consistently, the way we're gonna talk about, uh, you can reduce lawn weeds by up to 60% the first year and up to 93% when used uh, consistently over time. Um, the tricks, uh, or first I should tell you, there's a difference between uh, the corn gluten meal, which is what we have in the picture here, and um, its companion product, corn gluten spreadable granules. 
Uh, the powdery meal is very fine. It's, it's not something you want to put out on a windy day because it's very dusty. Uh, if you have a drop spreader, um, you'll have less mess than you will if you have a, a um, broadcast spreader because the broadcast spreader will help to, to uh, you know, uh, make the dust fly around more. So you will tend to get very dirty. You'll get it all over yourself. And uh, you will, you know, you'll basically be covered in yellow. So you want to do it in the morning or uh, when the wind is not um, uh, as, you know, as strong uh, or just on a day when it's not as windy uh, so that you're not getting as much dust blowing around. But um, uh, you can put it through a fertilizer spreader. Uh, the granules are easier to spread. They're less messy. Uh, they go through the spreader without making dust and all of that. But the problem is you don't get as good coverage as you do with the powder. And uh, so uh, for maximum effectiveness, we always recommend the meal over the, the granules. Um, they do have, they do contain 9% nitrogen. So uh, if you're fertilizing, uh, you know, with organic fertilizers, you can count your corn gluten meal application as a fertilizer application. And in fact, uh, if you put corn gluten meal down, uh, we recommend that you wait two weeks after you've put the corn gluten meal down uh, to put down your uh, uh, next application of organic fertilizer because you want to take advantage of the 9% nitrogen that's in the corn gluten meal. And um, it will uh, keep working for up to 60 days. And um, so um, because it's non-selective, it will prevent all seeds from germinating. So if you're trying to reseed your lawn, obviously you don't want to put corn gluten meal down. Um, you don't want to put it in any area where you might be planting um, any other kinds of seeds as well. If you're planting wildflower seeds or something like that, uh, you wanna make sure that you don't get any corn gluten meal in there. Uh, the other thing about corn gluten meal is the timing is very important. Um, the um, weeds, uh, as, as most of you probably know, weeds will sprout whenever the conditions, weather conditions are favorable and soil temperatures. So uh, right now we're in, in peak weed seed germination season. Um, sunny days and overnight temperatures in the mid fifties are perfect for dandelions and other weed seeds to germinate. So this would be uh, the time to put it down if you haven't already. Uh, if you haven't already, you're late. Uh, in North Texas, our season usually starts around mid-February and continues uh, basically through November. It does slow down in the summertime in the, in the extreme heat of summer, uh, but then it picks up again in the fall. Uh, so the usual application window is um, uh, you do it once in the, in the spring between February 15th and March 15th. And, in, and then in the fall between September 15th and October 15th. But again, as I said, weed seeds are germinating now. Uh, and in North Texas, seeds can germinate almost all year round. So it's very important that you not just look at the calendar, that you look at the weather and follow the weather. Um, and then um, depending on how long the weather continues to be favorable, you may need to apply two applications in a season. So, um, you know, if you put one down in September and that's good for 60 days, um, then you may want to do another one in November to, um, to make sure that the seeds aren't germinating through the winter. Um, you may even need to do another application in, in January. Again, you need to look at the calendar, not, uh, or look at the weather, not the calendar. I'm sorry. Uh, when you put it out, you want to put out at a rate of 20 pounds per thousand square feet. And uh, it needs to be watered in. So you want to water it in as soon as possible after you put it out. 
Um, you don't need to flood the lawn. You just need to lightly water it to make sure it's, it's wet. That will activate it. And um, uh, a quarter of an inch of water is, is plenty to make sure that you've, you've wet it properly. Uh, just keep in mind that it works on all seeds. And uh, so anything that you're trying to start from seed, you don't want to use corn gluten meal around it. Also too, a lot of people ask this, um, corn gluten meal will not harm animals or people. It's a food grade product. It's, it's literally just part of the corn uh, kernel that they've, uh, that they've extracted the gluten from. Uh, so it will not harm pets or wildlife. If your dog follows you around and tries to eat it, it won't hurt them. Uh, it may be an expensive treat, but it won't hurt them. Uh, so that's how you use corn gluten meal. And um, uh, then for post-emergence, there are several options. Uh, one that we have been using for a really long time now is the horticultural vinegar. Um, Nothing kills weeds faster than horticultural vinegar, uh, but you have to get horticultural vinegar, not grocery store vinegar, because the kind that you put on your salad is only about a 5% concentration, 5 to 8% at the most, um, which is actually makes a great fertilizer for uh, acid loving plants at that rate. Um, but for weed control, you need to use at least a 20% uh, strengths, and uh, we also sell a 30% strength, um, which is just, you know, is, is more potent. Um, you can use it on all types of weeds. It's non-selective, which means it will harm your lawn if you spray your lawn. So you want to try to target your spray onto the weed itself, and you want to saturate that with the product to make sure you've gotten it good and wet. And uh, we also recommend that you use our little um, uh, uh, vinegar and orange oil recipe uh, that um, uh, takes, you take an, uh, a gallon of vinegar and mix in an ounce of orange oil and a few drops of liquid soap in a tank sprayer. The orange oil in a, um, is also a weed killer on its own. Uh, so the two together make it stronger. Uh, and the uh, liquid soap acts as a surfactant to make it sticky so that it will stay on the plant longer uh, and absorb more of the acid, which is what kills the weed. And um, we have a video on our blog that we can that you can view that'll show you how fast it works. But basically, if you spray your weed in the morning on a sunny morning, uh, and go back out in two or three hours, that weed will be dead. That's how fast it works. Um, the, another option would be the Pure Grow Weed Crush, which is a relatively new product on the market, but uh, uh, some of our employees have used it and really like it. And uh, it's also recommended by Howard Garrett, if you're familiar with him. Uh, weed Crush is another non-selective weed killer. So uh, you want to be careful not to get that on your lawn. Uh, one way you can target the spray uh, to keep it off your grass is to just use a, a toilet paper roll and uh, put the toilet paper roll over top of the weed and then stick the uh, nozzle of your sprayer in, into the um, opening of that and that will keep it from getting any overspray on your grass. Uh, but uh, Weed Crush, both of these products are organic. They won't hurt any, uh, they won't hurt your pets. Uh, you don't want to spray your pet with it, obviously. It is a strong acid. You don't want to get it on your skin or in your eyes or anything like that. But um, uh, uh, once it's on the ground, uh, it's totally safe for your pets and, and uh, kids and whatnot to, to play on it. And then we also have um, a couple of more selective uh, post-emergent products to choose from. Uh, Pulverize is really great because it targets specifically broadleaf weeds and will not harm your grass. And uh, it comes in a ready to spray form. So you can 
uh, just basically water your lawn with it. Hook it up to your hose and water your lawn. Um, you don't have to worry about targeting anything and um, it will kill the broadleaf weeds and leave the grass unharmed. Uh, you may have to do more than one application, uh, but it does work very well. Um, and, um, and then another product that's more specific that targets grassy weeds uh, would be the Agrilon crabgrass killer. And uh, that also won't, won't harm St. Augustine or Bermuda, uh, but it will kill crabgrass and um, uh, basket grass, chickweed, clover, sticker burrs, uh, lots of other uh, grassy weeds, um, all without harming your St. Augustine. But uh, you do want to use this in a um, uh, localized uh, application. You don't want to try to spread this all over your lawn. It's it's expensive for one thing, and um, uh, you know you don't want to uh, to waste it. So you want to target put it on the put it on the weed itself. Um, so it is used as a spot treatment. Uh, it uses cinnamon bark to kill the weed. So again, organic product that will break down in the soil and become part of the soil and help uh, help your organic program that way as well as helping to get rid of your weeds. Uh, the Agrilon, uh, it's best that you use it in the morning while there's uh, already dew on the ground um, that because it does need moisture to activate it. So um, you can use it anytime, but if you do it when the grass is already wet, um, you know, that's great. If not, you can put it down and then water it afterwards, but you do need to water it in to activate it. And then um, I want to touch on watering too, because even though watering isn't really an organic thing, uh, we've we've seen just so many examples of of lawns that are watered incorrectly. That I want to touch on this, um, and you'll see in one of your handouts is uh, our top three watering mistakes. Um, but basically, most people overwater. Uh, most people water too often um, and at the wrong time of day. So um, they also forget to take into account rainfall. Uh, most people just want to be able to turn on their sprinklers, program their sprinklers, and, and then forget about it. And you really shouldn't be doing that. Um, it's not good for your lawn. It's, it's wasting water, but it's not good for your lawn. Um, and this example in this picture shows you the, the reason why on the root system of the, the grass, you'll see that um, when you water deeply but less frequently, uh, your, your root system of your grass is going to be much deeper and uh, um, more bulky um, and thicker than if you water in water frequently or if you only water very shallowly. Um, so you really want to, Texas A&M recommends that um, in, you know, in under normal temperatures, um, spring and fall temperatures, uh, generally speaking, you want to apply about one inch of water per week, one time once a week. So one inch of water in one application, not a quarter of an inch four times a week. Uh, and um, when you water shallowly, those, you know, you're not going to penetrate the soil enough, especially if you have clay soil. Uh, the water just isn't going to penetrate deep enough. Uh, and then um, if you water too often, you're also going to encourage fungus to grow and things like that. Uh, so it's much better with St. Augustine and Bermuda lawns to water one time a week, water deeply, and then let it dry out. It won't die in a week. Like no matter what time, even in the middle of summer, uh, your lawn is not going to completely die in a single week uh, from lack of water. So um, uh, it's better to let it dry out in between waterings and then water deeply uh, than it is to, you know, turn your sprinklers on for 15 minutes uh, three times a week. 
Uh, also watering at night encourages fungus. It's best to water early in the morning, right before the sun comes up, like around 4 a.m., 5 a.m. in that time frame. That way uh, you don't have as much evaporation from the sun being out. Uh, so more of it is going onto the soil and not evaporating. Uh, and then it has more time to penetrate um, before the sun does come up. And um, uh, so, but it doesn't sit on the soil long enough or on the, on the grass blades long enough to, um, you know, to cause those fungal problems that I mentioned. Okay, so um, let's see, that is um, the end of my presentation. So I want to get to some questions here if I can. Okay, uh, hopefully I answered Sharon Nice's question about uh, putting down organic cor uh, corn gluten meal. Um, uh, 20 pounds per thousand square feet is the recommended application rate. Uh, moles and grubs, uh, moles and grubs, that's an interesting combination. The moles are there to eat the grubs. So on the one hand, moles are good because they're eating your grubs. On the other hand, you've got moles, which is not good. Uh, so what do you do about that? Well, for one thing, uh, you can use um, uh, beneficial nematodes. Uh, we sell a special strain of beneficial nematodes that, uh, that target um, uh, larva in the soil. Uh, so it will kill grub worms, fire ant, larva, uh, and uh, um, if you have roly polies or sow bugs, um, that type of thing, it will target them as well. So uh, it also does fleas, uh, flies, and a few other things uh, that lay their eggs in the soil and go through a larval stage. Uh, and so one way to get rid of your grubs and, and whatnot is to put down these beneficial nematodes that will take away their food source, their primary food source, but they also eat earthworms and other things. So it wouldn't, it would get rid of your grubs, but it wouldn't necessarily get rid of the moles. Uh, the moles we recommend uh, repelling them with a, an organic repellent that uses, um, uh, castor bean oil. Uh, the castor oil basically gives them an uh, upset stomach and when it's absorbed by their food source, by the earthworms and, and whatnot, it doesn't hurt the earthworms or anything, uh, but when the mole consumes the earthworm, it's also consuming the castor oil and that upsets them and so they will just go somewhere else. Uh, unfortunately, they tend to come back again after a while. They will go visit your neighbor for a while and then when your neighbor puts it out, then they'll come back to you. So it's very, very difficult to trap them and kill them. Uh, you can try that. Uh, some people, uh, you know, uh, have luck doing that, but um, uh, I recommend that you get a cat. I had a cat that was very good at killing moles and uh, so having a cat can be helpful. Uh, but other than that, it's very difficult to trap them and kill them. Um, so you just kind of have to keep on repelling them. Uh, we do sell cottonseed meal. Uh, Nicole asked, uh, where can we buy cottonseed meal? We do sell that in smaller bags. Um, uh, I believe it's an eight pound size bag that we carry. So you can get cottonseed meal from us. Oh, by the way, speaking of fire ants, you can use a, a there is an organic bait, uh, be picked up as forage by the, um, by the uh, foraging ants and taken back to the queen and fed to the queen. Um, again, it's really difficult to get rid of them because their, their um, colonies can be like a whole acre or more. Uh, so they can spread out across uh, multiple yards in a suburban environment. Uh, the one fire ant colony can be spread out over several gardens. Uh, and so finding that queen is very difficult uh, and they move her around. So uh, that makes it even harder. Uh, but Texas A&M recommends that you put out a bait and that you 
d drench any mounds that you find anytime you find them. So uh, and there is an organic mound drench. Uh, we actually have several organic mound drenches to choose from. Um, and then we have an organic bait that you can put out. And then again, as I mentioned earlier, you can put out the beneficial nematodes. Uh, none of these products will hurt chickens. Uh, they're all uh, safe for them. They won't hurt your dog or cat either. A lot of them can be used uh, with chickens. For example, you can use diatomaceous earth uh, to keep the mites off your chickens. Uh, and you can also put that in their food. Um, with the organic weed controls, uh, you do not have to wait any length of time before planting uh, other plants in that area. You can just go ahead as soon as the the product is dry, basically, you can go ahead and um, uh, plant. And uh, thank you again, and um, thank you for having me.